talk about, we sing songs like that about how awesome it is when we get saved, right? Because it is an awesome thing, right? Are you guys sure about that? But the reality is sometimes it doesn't seem that awesome. Uh, by the way, we're going to be in Philippians again this morning. If you want to open your Bibles there so you can follow along with us. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 830 in that Brown Pew Bible. Uh, listening to that song kind of, kind of hit with the lesson this morning, the introduction to the lesson. Years ago, when I was uh, working with the youth in Seattle, uh, did a lock-in on them. I'm pretty sure we did it actually on Halloween night because the, the title of the lock-in was Night of the Living Dead. And what we did is we talked about the fact that when we are baptized, we die. We die to self, right? We go into the water as, and, and we're buried there because we die. But we keep on living. And so the whole thing was Night of the Living Dead. It was a really cool uh, deal, uh, really cool lock-in. I think we actually baptized some kids at the end of it. The church up there, uh, when I was there, we had, I think, five teenagers. Not a very big youth group or anything, but that night at the lock-in, we had almost 50 kids there, which was just pretty phenomenal. They hadn't really had that much attendance for anything, but part of the reason for that is earlier that summer, I had uh, directed a senior teen camp and met a lot of the kids from a lot of churches in the area, and they all came and they invited their friends because we all had such a great time at camp together. But one of the things that I remember most about the Night of the Living Dead was a conversation I had with a young lady that had attended that camp earlier in the summer. Can't remember her name, but I do remember the conversation because at camp, when she came up and she wanted to be baptized, I gave her the standard speech I usually give to, to young people when they want to get baptized. I said, now, I want you to understand that just because you're giving your life to Jesus and you're being baptized does not magically make everything in your life go perfect. A lot of times people get that idea that if I, you know, things are going hard and I'm having a lot of struggles, if I get baptized, everything's going to go great and all of those problems are going to go away. But I told her that's not always the case. In fact, a lot of times, once we give our lives to God, that really makes the enemy mad. And he will do everything he can to try to convince us that we've made a mistake. And so sometimes, after we're baptized, life just falls apart. So we had had the camp that summer, in probably August, and then in October, uh, for Halloween, we're doing this lock-in, and she comes to the lock-in. And I remember during one of our break times or something, she came and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, absolutely. So she and I went over into one of the classrooms there, and she just breaks down and is just sobbing. I mean, heartbroken, devastated young lady. She tells me that when she got home from camp, her parents informed her they were getting divorced. She had no clue it was coming. She told me that her parents, since she was a senior in high school, had given her the uh, job of choosing which parents she wanted to live with. And she said that the last couple of months had just been absolutely miserable since she had gotten baptized. Parents fought all the time. She was constantly moving back and forth between mom's house and dad's house. And both of them were trying to convince her to live with them. She said it was absolutely horrible. She said, everything you told me about the enemy came true. Devastated she was. And you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that get the idea, like I said, that if you get baptized, then everything's going to go great. There are actually people that preach a gospel that kind of says that. We call it a health and wealth gospel. You know, that if you'll accept Jesus into your life, you'll never be sick again. You'll never get COVID if you accept Jesus into your life. You don't even have to be vaccinated. Jesus is the ultimate vaccination. And you'll never get, be poor again. In fact, whatever you ask in Jesus' name, you'll get it. So if you want a new car, if you want money, you want this, you want that, all you got to do is ask it. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're going to get everything. Well, that's not always true. And this young lady experienced that it wasn't true. 
And probably some of you here today have experienced that that's not true. In fact, the Bible never teaches that. And the Bible explicitly teaches over and over again that if we are followers of Jesus, we're going to suffer with Him. Life is not always going to be easy. Christians are going to endure hardships and trials and, and suffering. And when those time co times come, kind of like this young lady, she was beginning to doubt whether she had made the right decision. She told me, she said, you know, maybe if I hadn't been baptized, then Satan wouldn't have attacked my parents and they wouldn't be getting divorced. Maybe if I hadn't given my life to God, things would have been okay. Because see, what happens with most of us is when things are going really bad, we begin to kind of focus on self. What could I have done to make things good for me? What can I do now to make things better for me? Because when things are going really bad in our life, we want them back good for us. And so we begin turning our focus back on ourselves. This must have been, or probably was something similar to what was going on in the church in Philippi. They had all become Christians. Things were going really well at first, but now things are beginning to kind of fall apart a little bit, you know? Paul is in prison. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. He's in prison in Rome, and it's looking like Paul may never get out. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute. If following Jesus is what it's all about, then why would somebody be killed for following Jesus? Not only that, but they had sent a, a man named Epaphrodites down to take some gifts to Paul to kind of help him while he was down there. And Epaphrodites gets down there and gets sick. I mean, really sick, almost to the point of death. And when those kind of things happen, you begin to question, you know, hey, is this really right? Are, are we really doing the right thing? And I, be, and I think probably some people in the congregation there in Philippi were beginning to have those doubts and beginning to turn their focus on themselves. And when we do that, uh, when we start turning our focus on ourselves, then that just sets the stage for uh, arguments and bickering and stuff. Because if I'm focused on what's best for Lance, and I'm not focused on what's best for Mark, and Mark's focused on what's best for Mark, he's not going to take care of what Lance needs, and before long, Lance and Mark are going to be arguing because we both want something different. And that could be what happened to this couple, these two ladies there in the church named Eodia and Syntyche. Because for some reason, even though they had been followers of Jesus for a long time and they've worked with Paul for a long time, all of a sudden they're not getting along. And that's kind of what happens when we begin to shift the focus from a selfless life to a selfish life. And all throughout the Gospels, all throughout the Bible, we are told over and over again that Christians are supposed to live a selfless life. We're to die to self to live for others. And so when Paul gets this feedback from the church in Philippi and he knows these struggles are going on, he writes to remind them and to encourage them and to teach them how to respond in, in these kind of situations and circumstances. And the way he does it is by reminding them of the good and faithful lives they have lived in the past and encouraging them to continue living that regardless of the circumstances. I mentioned last Sunday when Audrey came forward and asked for prayers, I mentioned how inspiring and encouraging it is to me to see people who have been Christians for a long time still working out their faith, still struggling with things. And I told you how encouraging it was to me years ago when I was beginning to question whether anything I was doing was having any kind of an impact. And Nadine Skinner called me and told me that one of my sermons had inspired her to reach out and forgive some people that she had not been willing to forgive. And so it's an encouragement when people tell us, you know, you've done good. Just keep doing good. And so Paul writes to the church in Philippi to kind of remind them of what they've all already done and to, to keep doing it. Because sometimes we begin to feel discouraged and overwhelmed overwhelmed, and the best medicine for that is to be reminded of the good and faithful lives that we've done in the past, or lived in the past. And so Paul reminds the church in Philippi 
of what they've done. And then he encourages them. In chapter 3, verse 16, he says, only let us live up to what we have already attained or already attained. He's reminding them, you guys know what the truth is. Don't get discouraged. Don't get distracted by all the negative stuff that's going on. You just keep living the life that you were called to live. Last week I mentioned that there were a couple of major themes that Paul touches on in this letter. And one of those is this theme of the selfless life. The life that Christians are to live. And Paul describes this uh, in his own attitude. In chapter 1, beginning in verse 21, Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the, in the body, this, is well, this, is, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is necessary for you that I remain in the body. Notice that for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, to die is so much better because if I die, I get to go be with Christ. There's no more struggles. There's no more hardship. I get to be with Him forever and ever. And that is so much better than anything else. And that's what I desire. How many of you desire to go and be with the Lord? A couple of you. A couple of you are like, not yet. Uh, maybe after lunch today. But, but yeah, that's what we desire. But notice that Paul says, that's what I desire, but it is necessary for me to stay here and be with you. Church, that's what the selfless life is all about, is putting aside our own desires to meet the needs of someone else. That's what Paul is, is alluding to there when he says, yeah, I desire to leave and be with the Lord, but it's necessary for you that I remain in the body. And Paul didn't just come up with this on his own. He's actually following the example of Jesus because that's what we get to uh, over in chapter 2. In fact, Paul is telling the church there, you know, this is not just a, an outward thing. This is a mindset, a mindset of willingness to sacrifice self for the good of others. And he says in verse 5, your attitude should be that, should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who... Being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And, and, I, and I know this, the way that this is worded makes it a little bit uh, confusing sometimes because some people say that, that Paul is saying Jesus was trying to be like God. He was grasping at being like God. But that's not what was going on here. He was God. And so when it says that he did not consider... Uh, Equality with God something to be grasped. That means held on to. He already has it. But it, even though that was so awesome to be holding on to and be God, he knew that we needed something else. And so, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, I know, his desire must have been to remain in glory. But yet he knew that we needed something else. We needed him to come. We needed him to die for our sins. He was selfless in his life. And we know that this is, is honored by God because in verse 9 it says, Therefore, because he was willing to leave the glory of heaven and come down and sacrifice for us, God raised him and exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus demonstrated this selfless living. 
And so Paul, pointing out his example and pointing out the example of Jesus, he reminds them of this and reminds them to follow this example. But he also points out that they've already demonstrated this selfless life. This is not something new for them. They've already done it. If you go back into chapter 1, verse 3 through 6, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. They've already been working with him. And Paul uh, goes on with this in verse 7, and he says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus. And then in verse 9, And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. You see, Paul says, you guys have been doing the right thing from the beginning. Don't stop. Just because some things are not going the way that you want them to or expect them to doesn't mean that you stop living the selfless life, but I want you to do that even more and more, and I want you to understand that more and more. He also uses Timothy as an, or wait a minute, going back, uh, after teaching them uh, or going over their history of selflessness and praying for that to increase, uh, he reminds them of the instructions that they're to follow in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, when he says, uh, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. That whole statement about considering others better than yourself has always kind of bothered me because, you know, there are some people that aren't as good off as I am. And I'm not saying that in any kind of arrogance or anything, but those are exactly the people that we need to reach out to. Those that aren't doing as well as we are, those who are struggling and, and what Paul is really saying here is you consider the needs of others greater than your desires for yourself. Be like Jesus. Have the same attitude that he has. And then he uses Timothy as an example of this. In chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Timothy cared for other people and did what was necessary for other people. And so and when Paul gets to the closing part of his letter in chapter 4, he reminds them again that they've already been living this selfless life and they need to continue to do so. In chapter 4, verse 10, he says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. But now they have. And then if you get down into uh, chapter 4, verse 14, when he says, Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out for Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. And then drop down into verse 18, he says, I have received full payment, and even more, I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And what we notice in here is that selfless life, the willingness to do for others and meet the needs of others instead of just meeting our own desires is one of these things that is admirable to God. That's why he says, you know, that it's pleasing to God. And in verse 17, he says, not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. God looks at us when we live a selfless life, and God says, way to go. That is the way 
you ought to be living your life. It's pleasing to God. And so our challenge, like theirs, is expressed in chapter 3, verse 16, only let us live up to what we've already attained. To remember chapter 1, verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, it's, it's so easy, especially when things seem to not be going right, to become self-focused. When things are going bad for me, it's hard for me to focus on the needs of others because I have my desires, I have what I want to do and what I want to do to make things better for me. And I can become very annoyed when other people come to me with needs when I'm too busy trying to take care of my own desires. And sometimes when I get in those attitudes, because that's what all of this is, is it's an attitude of the mind. When I get those wrong kind of attitudes, sometimes God will put a little gentle reminder in there for me. Flying back from Missoula on Friday was a really awesome trip. Got to the airport in Missoula. At 9.30 in the morning, I watch a guy finish his fourth beer and another order a double Bloody Mary. And I'm thinking, it's 9.30 in the morning, guy. I, I just, you know, anyway... But the flight was on time, we all get on the plane, and it was packed. I mean, there was not one seat left available, but it was still a good flight. Met a young lady who used to work for Patagonia, and now works for Black Diamond, I think, does developing sportswear and outdoor wear and stuff like that. She wouldn't give me any free samples, but we had a really neat conversation and stuff. And uh, then we fly to Denver, where I changed planes. We landed at gate 52, and I walked out of the plane, and I look at my phone to see where my next flight to Moline is, and it's at gate 53. It's right across, and it's like, how often does that happen? And I'm thinking, you know, boy, the Lord is blessing me. I mean, this is going to be a smooth sailing. I told Lori the only problem I had on the whole trip is when I was in Denver, I went to order a taco. I wanted one taco. So I go up to the, to the counter there, and I told the lady, I said, I want one taco carnitas taco and she says one tacos I said yes one taco she says one tacos now, I didn't realize she's making a plural my one taco became one order of tacos so I got three tacos but I thought if that's the worst thing that happens on this trip that's all right so anyway get on the plane to fly to Moline every seat on the plane is full except for the one right next to me and I'm sitting there, man, I am so excited. It's like, man, this is great. Because I'm at the very back seat. The back of my seat rests up against the restrooms. I can't recline or anything. And got a like two, two and a half hour flight. And I'm thinking, this is perfect. You know, the Lord is blessing me because I've got an empty seat next to me. I'm going to be able to kick back over there and stretch my legs out. And I'm going to love this. And then just as the door is getting ready to shut, somebody else comes on. A young lady with a crying baby. <laughs> I behaved myself, but it reminded me so quickly how easy it is for our attitude to become selfish. And we begin to desire what we want instead of being a servant. I wasn't on that plane as a servant at that moment. And God reminded me, Lance, you're called to be a servant. I don't care what the circumstances are. You are called to be a servant. I want us this morning to be thinking about that. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know the struggles or frustrations that you're having. But my guess is that you're a lot like me. And sometimes when things aren't going the way you want, you can become pretty self-focused. So what I want us to all do this morning, give me a little exercise here. You don't have to say it out loud, but I want you to think about sometime recently when you have acted in a selfish way. And then I want you to confess that silently. God 
to give that over to him. But I don't want us to stop there. Because just like Paul doesn't reprimand that church for being selfish, he reminds them and encourages them of the times when they have already lived that selfless life. And so I want you to think of a time when you sacrificed for someone else. A time when you gave to someone who was in need. A time when you put someone else's needs above your own desire. And as you're thinking about that, I want you to listen to these words that Paul wrote in chapter 4 beginning in verse 8 when he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And that last statement is one that is so important. And the God of peace will be with you. See, life is full of challenges. There will always come times when you think that when you want things to go smoothly and they don't. There will be times when we question the decisions we've made. But in those times, we need to do what Paul says in this letter, and forget what is behind and press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I like the way the ESV translates that, that statement or that passage in chapter 3, verse 12. The English Standard Version says, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We need to always remember, no matter what's going on around us, no matter how bad things are going for us, that we died to our old self. And we were raised to live for Christ. That's what I reminded that young lady whose life seemed to have fallen apart. We sing these songs, you know, heaven came down, glory filled my soul, and it does. But that doesn't mean life's always going to be perfect. That's why we need lessons like this, like we talked last week. We need attitude adjustments to remind us who we really are and how we're called to live regardless of the circumstances. Let's pray, and then we'll have our song. Our Father, we thank you for your word because your word reminds us that even when life is not going the way it should, your son still died for us. Even when we were yet sinners, he died for us. And your word reminds us, Father, that we have been given a new life. We have been called. Uh, we've been made a new creation. And in that, as, in that new life, as that new creation, we have a calling. And that calling is to live as your son did. With a willingness to give up our own desires to meet the needs of others. Father, that's really the essence of Christianity. I pray, Father, that you help us always to live that out no matter what's going on in our lives. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name.